Well, I'm glad everybody could make it here today. Um, I'm Alex Brickoff, and I'll be hosting this clinic tonight. As always, our clinic tonight is sponsored by the fourth division of the Pacific Northwest Region of the National Model Railroad Association. Okay, uh, my name is Bob Stafford. I'm uh, retired off the uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, originally started on Erie Lackawanna as an agent operator. And after we were getting con job by Conrail, went to work for the Burlington Northern on the Alliance Division and started there in January of 1979. Survived the Frisco Northern days and survived getting Santa flushed and all these years on it and retired off the Burlington Northern as, as a train master at Bellingham. So uh, when I was working on the Alliance Division, on the extra board, I worked all over the division. Basically, I've worked every station from Worland, Wyoming to Clayton, New Mexico, except for uh, Puerto, Wyoming. Never, never caught that off the extra board. So uh, there was a lot of grain co uh, country and uh, was involved with, with way building out uh, unit grain trains and cuts of, of cars and multiple car shipments and things, things like that in the time I spent up there in the Alliance Division. I'm, I measure my time there as three winters. So most modelers think of a uh, unit grain train as a train just runs across the layout and doesn't do any work on line. You know, just another uh, through freight for the local uh, freight train to have to clear. But if you're modeling grain producing areas of the Midwest or the Pacific Coast area, the West Coast, or the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of operation to be built into your model railroad. I worked in the BN in Nebraska, Colorado during the 1980s and 1990s, and often there was a lot of work to make a unit grain train. You know, this was a time before super elevators and shovel trains. The country elevator was still common throughout the Midwest. Most of these elevators had track layouts loading 40-foot boxcars that had been modified to load covered hopper cars. The tracks that were spotted were often short, only the largest elevators could load a unit grain train in one spotting. Unit grain trains were sold by the grain marketing department in 26 car lots. The full grain train consisted of four lots combined together. I will explain to you today how we distributed the cars out to the elevators to load and how the unit grain trains were made up. Let's begin with how the empty cars were distributed to the elevators. The grain marketing department works with the elevators in a given area and coordinates with them when se several elevators working together will have enough grain on hand to load a unit train. Sometimes all the elevators are located on the same line, sometimes they were not. Once marketing was set up with the elevators as to when they would be ready to load the empty, the, the empty car orders were placed for each elevator. This information was passed on to the grain desk in Fort Worth, Texas. As empty grain uh, unit trains returned from unloading at ports or large inline land uh, terminal elevators, the grain desk assigned the cars to these trains for loading. The empty train was then moved to the location where it was needed to distribute the cars. The decision on how the cars would be spotted depended upon if the elevators were all on the same line or if they were located on several lines served from one yard. If the elevators were all located on the same line, the extra crew most often would be called to spot the cars in 26 car lots. Four elevators might take 26 cars each or one elevator 54 cars and two others 26 cars each. Or two elevators might each take 54 cars. So just didn't know, it depends upon the capacity of the elevators. If the cars were for spotting on a branch line, then the cars often were just added to the local train serving the branch to spot as part of its normal work. No additional power would be added to the local to handle the additional cars. If the local was an online local working from an outlying point, the power to arrive with the unit train would be left for the local to use to spot the cars. An additional consideration was if a branch line could handle six hour, six axle power or not. If the branch was restricted to four axle power, 
The road power will be changed out for local Jeeps at an online yard near the destination junction. When several loading elevators were located on different lines, the empty grain train was run into the yard that served that area. It was broken up and the cars were put on local freights that served the lines loading the empties that were located on them. For example, when I worked in the Alliance Division, empty grain trains either came from Texas via the Denver or the Pacific Northwest, normally uh, through the North Line via Laurel, Montana and Gillette, Wyoming. On arrival of Alliance, the 108 car train would be yard at the North Yard in Alliance. The empty C6 hoppers, C6 hopper is a 100 ton grain car. Model railroader calls them LOs. Nobody in the railroad calls anything an LO at XM or anything like that, okay? There you are, C6 hoppers. The empty C6 hoppers would be added to model trains to spot, to, yeah, to local trains to spot online. For example, 54 cars could be added to the local that runs from Alliance in Lincoln, Nebraska. A 26 car lot plus one extra car would be set out at Seneca and another lot at Broken Bow for loading. 54 cars are added to the local that ran between Alliance and Guernsey, Wyoming. These cars were set out on the west, on the eastward siding at Baird, Nebraska on a trip to Guernsey. The next morning, when the Baird turn came on duty as part of his normal day's operation between Baird, Nebraska and Torrington, Wyoming, it would spot 27 empty cars at the elevator at Baird and another 27 cars at the elevator at Mitchell, Nebraska. Normally one extra car was spotted as part of each lot in case a car was found to be defective before loading. Elevators normally loaded the extra car if they had it. 108 grain cars have now been loaded at the four locations, Broken Bow, Seneca, Baird, and Mitchell. Now it's time to make up a grain train for Vancouver, Washington, uh, Tacoma, or Seattle. The local from Lincoln to Alliance will now be instructed to pick up the loaded cars of Broken Bow and Seneca as part of their work orders and handle them into Alliance. When the local arrives in the East Yard Alliance, these cars will be set over onto a track. They'll be inspected by the car to inspectors, the caboose at it, set to yard air, inspected again at all the brakes are set, released. And while this is going on, the grain desk has already assigned a train symbol to call the crew against and to call power against it. In this case, it'll be the first G55 of the 14. G55 is a symbol for grain alliance of Tacoma. The one is for first train of day 14 of the month. So one G5514. Now that the train's been authorized, the power desk in Fort Worth assigns locomotives to the train. The roundhouse prepares the power for the train and sets up the ready tracks. A crew is called against this symbol. They get their power from the house. They back it onto the train. They make their initial terminal air test with the carman. And once the uh, air test is done, a new grain train is born. Now we'll leave uh, Alliance with their 54 cars. Instructions to pick up from the elevators at Baird and Mitchell. The road crew makes the pickups, performing initial air tests on each of the pickups before adding them to the train. As each block is added to the train, the set and release air test is done before it picks up, before it leaves the pickup location. And another thing that would sometimes be done is if the cars from the north were going to be delayed, uh, meeting the cars down on the south line at Baird or Mitchell, then and the elevator needed the room, then the Baird turn would pick those cars up on their return back from Torrington, Wyoming, and put them in the east siding at Baird for pickup. And on the prototype railroad, we do not have passing sidings. They only exist in model railroad magazines. We have sidings. Siding is a track auxiliary to the main line, purpose for which is to meet and pass trains. So uh, anyways, the, uh, the east siding at Baird would, would hold the cars if, uh, if they were going to be delayed to pick up. So, the, so the, now our, our G55 is gonna is, will come down from Alliance. 
They'll travel the, the south line, as we called it. That's the line that went from uh, Northport, Nebraska to uh, Laurel, Montana via Casper, Wyoming. They'll make its pickup. It's going to go uh, west of Laurel, and then from Laurel, they'll go on to Spokane, and then they go on into the uh, grain yard at Pasco, Washington. Remember, our grain train has made up of cars from four different elevators for export from the Port of Tacoma. The wheat loaded in these cars is from the sand hills of Nebraska. It has a time I have a lower moisture or protein content than the wheat loaded from elevators along the North Platte River. The ship being loaded at Tacoma for Japan is to be loaded with, uh, with wheat that has to meet a certain protein and, and uh, moisture content. So the G55 14 has 54 cars of wheat that meet the elevator's need for a particular kind of wheat and 54 cars that don't. So only 54 cars this train will be accepted for spotting for export at the grain elevator on arrival at Tacoma. So we're going to do with the other 54 cars of wheat. In the grain yard at Pasco, another train has arrived. Uh, the 15, I mean the one G19 of the 12 has arrived with wheat harvested in the McCook, Nebraska area. It has 54 cars of wheat with the proper protein moisture content needed to load the ship and 54 cars will not be accepted this time by the export elevator. So at the grain yard in Pasco, both trains are now gonna be switched. 54 cars of grain from each train that meets the elevator's needs will be added and together form one train at 54 uh, cars from each train are rejected will be put together and form a basically a second train if I think of it that way. These, these kind of moves were often done at, uh, done at Pasco. And uh, once the, uh, the, the uh, two trains are switched out, then they would be uh, moved to the export elevator and uh, loaded on the ship. And uh, one of the symbols would be, uh, would, would go through and then the other symbol would be held at Pasco until the elevator called in at those uh, 108 cars. And then those, those, those 108 cars would, uh, would go on into the elevator for export. And when, when grain lots were sold in an area that, that did not produce enough volume to, boot, to produce a grain train, the cars were moved to merchandise service to a point where they could be combined with grain from another location to form a grain train. Laurel, Montana was a yard where this happened quite often. Freight trains would pick up grain cars at smaller elevators and, or as pickups from small yards where local freights had lined up the cars for west pickup. As these lots of grain cars came into Laurel, Montana, they were combined into 108 car grain trains as instructed by the grain desk and sent west to the Pacific Northwest for delivery to the elevators. But not all grain trains went to the ports. They also went to large inland terminal elevators and places such as Minneapolis, St. Paul, Kansas City, Hutchison, Kansas, Fort Worth, and others. Terminal elevators sort grain and store grain and hold grain basically until a, either a buyer is found for it or the price of it goes up. These are the elevators at Hutchison, Kansas in this aerial view. And the one in the foreground for several decades was the largest grain elevator in the world with the largest elevator um, conveyor system in the world. And also a uh, smaller box of cars were sold including 26 lot shipments and the individual car lots or multiple car lot shipments such as 10 car shipments. For, for, movement, for movement in merchandise trains. One interesting movement of a unit train to supply animal and poultry feed companies terminates here in the Pacific Northwest. The feed elevators in Stanwood, Ferndale, and Sumas, Washington all work together to order a 108 car unit train of corn. The grain train is operating at Bayside Yard at Everett, Washington, where it terminates. The cars for each of these destinations are added to the uh, three local freights that serve them. So normally 54 cars of grain were consigned to Ferndale Grain, 26 cars to Allen Bass Feed and Sumas, and 26 cars to Wolf Kill Feed and Stanwood. None of these feed dealers have the capacity to take delivery of their cars in one spotting. 
The cars have to be moved and staged for spotting as the feed dealers have capacity to unload them. Wolf Kill can take five cars at a time on its track to unload. The Conway Turn, the local freight to serve Stanwood three times a week, will have five cars per day put into his train at Bayside to spot at Wolf Kill until all the cars are unloaded. The corn cars are, start, are stored at Bayside Yard until ordered in by Wolf Kill. To move the cars of cold, to Ellen Bass Feed and Sumas, they're added to train 644, which is a daily haulage train between uh, Everett and Sumas. On arrival at Sumas, 644 sets his train out in the siding on the south end of town and picks up its return train uh, off the old Milwaukee line to and returns back to Everett. When the Sumas switch engine comes on duty at 7 a.m., Ellen Bass would have ordered in as many cars as they have room to unload, normally 10 to 12 cars. This is Ellen Bass here in the photograph. The Sumas switcher will spot them up for unloading, and each day more cars will be spotted by the switcher crew until the cars of corn are all unloaded. The remaining 54 cars of corn at Bayside consigned to Ferndale Grain will move out on train 627, the haulage train between Everton and, and uh, Bellingham, Washington. The uh, 54 cars are set out at, in the Bellingham yard by 627 when he terminates there. Ferndale Grain will have ordered in by 6 a.m. how many cars they want spotted for unloading, which normally is about a dozen cars. The Bellingham switch engine comes on duty at 8 a.m gets its work orders for that day. Besides switching the local industries, this job also makes up the Night Cherry local freight. Uh, the Night Cherry comes to duty 8 p.m. and switches Ferndale Grain. And the excess uh, cars are stored in Bellingham Yard until they're ordered in by uh, Ferndale Grain to spot. And as the uh, corn cars are made empty, they funnel back into the yard at Everett on train 627, 644 in a Conway turn. On arrival at Everett, the cars are marked up as empties for Pasco, Washington. The C6 empties for now, out this entire region are sent to Pasco, except empty 108 car trains released by the big port elevators, which the grain desk cons consigns directly uh, in the computer to their next destination. So as the empties C6s arrive at Pasco, they're made in 100 eight car empty grain trains assigned destinations by the grain desk in Fort Worth and the cycle begins all over again. The empties move to the Midwest and we start the spotting process all over again. Now at lo locations with flour mills was normal for the uh, for the flour mills also got their cars and merchandise service. Most of them didn't get uh, unit trains. When flour mills received cars, the flour mills ordered cars in by individual car numbers. You did not just take 20 cars and weed it over and shove it into a flour mill. That was not done. The, the, uh, the flour mills all ordered the cars in according to the, to the protein content in each car. When a car is loaded at the elevators, their grain inspector goes out with a big long metal probe. He opens up the top door on the, on the car, sticks this probe, it's about four foot long, down into the grain, gets a sample of, of the grain. He does that to every car that's loaded. And then the elevators have what they, they call the lab. They have a machine in there that this grain is dumped into a hopper, and this machine analyzes the grain for how much protein it has, how much moisture is in the grain, and how much uh, foreign material is, is, is in the grain. So as this grain comes into the flour mills, they have this information from the shipper. And also the flour mill sometimes will go out with their own inspectors and start checking cars to, to uh, double check them. So flour mills order in individual cars. So you'll have several tracks of cars to go into a flour mill and you'll end up switching every track in the yard to get certain cars that they want and, and gather up to go spot into a flour mill. I mean, a flour mill makes, makes a lot of model railroad work if you want to think of it that way. And also this multiple car type of railroading was also done a limited basis 
with 40 foot box cars in the late 70s and early 80s. When I worked the operators extra board 1979 and on the old uh, CB&Q High Line, which was the original CB&Q main line to Cheyenne, Wyoming, it was still in place from a junction called O'Fallon's, Nebraska and Sterling, Colorado. The O'Fallon's are connected with the, the main line from Denver to Chicago. And at Sterling, Colorado, it connected with a line that uh, went from Brush, Colorado, north up towards Alliance, Nebraska. And the high line could not handle C6 hoppers. If I remember correctly, there were still parts of that branch that had 65 pound rail on it. So we couldn't send 100 ton cars on it. This was, so this was a grain loading line, lots of elevators of various size on it. Due to the track restrictions, the elevators were forced to load 40 foot box cars until track updates were completed in 1980. The branch was worked by a uh, local freight started at two ends. One left McCook every day, one left Sterling every day. The two trains would meet at Holyoke, Nebraska, and the, crew, and the two crews stay overnight in this old railroad hotel there across the street from the depot. The next day, they, they uh, swapped trains, uh, used the same power cabooses that they had assigned to them and went back to McCook or Sterling. And a load of uh, grain cars that go west moved to Sterling, where they were added to freight trains going uh, like north uh, toward, towards Alliance. And then these cars eventually made their way in, into to Laurel and then on out to the Pacific Northwest. And the cars that were going east were moved to McCook and they, and they were added to trains there. And the east cars, McCook uh, was traffic going to, uh, to Kansas City, uh, Chicago, Twin ports and uh, oh, and also the traffic going down the Gulf of Mexico normally moved moved to Sterling and then it moved via Denver and then on down to CNS and FWD to Houston and Galveston. And in 1979, the railroad had a push to convert all the grain shipments to C6 cars. The only grain loading the box cars that I ever saw was on the High Line, and then I understood the Marshall branch out of Wenatchee also was loading 40 foot cars at this time because of track conditions. And as the 40 foot cars needed major repairs, they were being taken out of service and sold for scrap. And the car supply on 40 foot box cars, which we call, they were B1s on the railroad, was getting very tight. And the grain elevator at uh, Grant, Nebraska, French Valley Elevator, they cut a deal with the BN marketing department. They would line stock cars with plywood at their own expense to load grain into if the railroad assigned it to them for their exclusive use. So they got a bunch of uh, great northern stock cars and they lined these stock cars with plywood and they were an assigned service to the elevator there at uh, Grant, New Nebraska. At this time, mostly I was working up in the South Platte Valley or we call it the South Line normally, Northport, Nebraska, or Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, or Guernsey, Wyoming. And I see large blocks of 40 foot uh, uh, grain box cars and these stock cars would be moving west towards Laurel, the merchandise trains, until the High Line was upgraded in 1980. And that was the end of the box car traffic. Now that you see now the prototype does it, how are you going to do it on your railroad? Are you going to run two grain trains from staging and swap out blocks of cars and route at a yard? Are you going to gather up cars from several places and bring them into one yard and originate a grain train? Or build a block of cars to be added to a grain train at another location, either modeled or not? Are you going to run a train into a yard from a staging track and break it up for delivery to several elevators on your layout? or even uh, staging destinations? Are you gonna have your locals pick up grain cars from modeled elevators and take them to a yard track or a siding for pickup to fill out a grain train originating from staging or from another yard on your layout? How about manifest train coming out of staging and sets out a block of grain cars for pickup by a grain train coming out of stage, staging later to fill that grain, grain train out the size? Or several manifest trains can set out loaded grain cars 
in a yard. These cars are combined in that yard to make a unit grain train. And then all of these moves can also be made in reverse order to move the empties back and move them to the elevators in the same process that they originally left. Now there's more to running a grain train on a model railroad than just watching it go round and round and round or from staging track to staging track. Now those, those are the kind of operations you can do. Now I'm sure if you think about it, you might come up with, with others that will custom fit to your model railroad. And with that, you know, we've, we've reached the very end of, of the grain funnel, the Continental Grain Elevator Terminal in Federal Bay Yard in uh, Seattle. And that's this part of the presentation. And then while I was doing this, I found some interesting photos I think that you might enjoy. This is a, these are from the Hegley uh, Museum Collection. This is a grain inspector at work. See the big long tube he has there? Those are wooden grain doors. He's Climbing up there, he's gonna he's gonna take that brass tube and he's gonna shove it down into the grain to get his grain samples to be taken into the lab to be analyzed. And he's got his assistant there to keep swapping out tubes with him. And then how how, how do you unload a box car, a grain? Well, this was a machine that was like a great big broom. It spun around. That's the way I understood the way this thing worked. I never saw one working. It says spun around and pulled the grain towards the door so it could fall out of the boxcar door. And there was pits underneath the track. Here, here's the pit underneath the track. So the, so the grain would fall out, out, out of the boxcar doors and into the pit. And there was a conveyor belt that then took, took the grain up into another series of conveyor belts that carried them up into the grain storage silos. And if you'll notice on the picture there, you see the guy in the boxcar? What he has there is, it's a scoop. That scoop was attached to three cables. And the three cables were attached to a winch. So he would go in the boxcar and he would put that scoop down into the grain. Then the, his buddy would operate the winch and pull that scoop towards the boxcar door with him uh, guiding it with, with his handles. And then when they got all done with the box car, there was two methods of handling the box car. You either swept it out by hand and shovel, or some of the really the large gray uh, terminal elevators had these humongous vacuum cleaners. They could go in there and suck the grain up. How would you like to have that on your living room floor? <laughs> okay. So they would vacuum the grain up in the big, big terminal elevators, and the smaller elevators did it all by hand. And here's a photograph I found uh, in Joan, Minnesota in the early 1920s. Uh, a ramp to load bulk grade in the box cars, just like, like coal, coal trucks would dump coal into coal cars. Well, they, were, they made a ramp, they made a wooden chute, and they were dumping their dump, dump trucks of grain directly into the box car. Uh, that would make a neat model for somebody who was a period model modeling in the 1920s. And this would be your typical box car of that era that they would be loading the uh, grain into. This is the Lake Erie Western car. And this is a box car that shows you, well, we call these paper grain doors. Uh, they were a heavy, heavy craft paper like, and they had steel bands embedded into them. And then uh, the steel bands would be nailed to the wood posts on each side of, of, of the car door. Uh, that was called coopering a car. So when the cars are coopered, the guy had to nail them from the inside. Then he had to crawl up and over the, over the grain door to get out of the car. You had to be pretty athletic for that job because you didn't have a ladder. You just pulled yourself up and over. Now what they're doing here is they're opening up the car door. Uh, using a tractor with a chain, with a hook at the end of the chain and hooking it to the door. And, and using the tractor to pull the door open was quite, a, uh, was quite common. And the guy on, on the ground there, he, he's holding back the, uh, the latch on, on the door so it'll, so it'll move. Most of the time this worked, but once in a while, if they didn't have a good tractor operator, they would rip the door right off the side of a boxcar. And a lot of boxcars got to, uh, got damaged done, done to the door from, from being hit, hit by the buckets. And this Chicago Great Western car here, he's got um, grain doors sideways in the car. 
see through the wooden grain doors. And what this was done was um, some of your smaller uh, animal and, and poultry feed operations. They might order two different types of feed from an elevator. Uh, both, like they, they, might, they might, might get some corn and some bulk wheat middlings. So one half the car would be one commodity, the other half of the car would be the other commodity, and then the, the, the gap in the middle would keep the two commodities from contaminating each other. Or another thing we used to have is we used to have what we called set out cars. This was with merchandise and in a few cases grain, and especially with uh, feed that had been bagged. And what the set out cars were, uh, the contents of them would go to two or three different locations in two or three different towns with different consignees. So the car would, uh, would stop off at, at the first place and be set out. Actually, they're called stop off cars, not set out, I was wrong. And then the consignee would unload his part of the car and seal it and close the door and the agent would put a new, new seals on them and bill it out to the next stop off point. And there the car would be unloaded and sometimes even went to a third place and the car be unloaded. So it, it could even be used for a bulk, a bulk grain car occasionally would be done with this, but it was mostly done with, uh, with a package feed. And this is an example of a car that's uh, got the wooden grain doors in it. Wooden grain doors were made from two by 10 planks, maybe two by 12. There'd be three of them high, and there would be uh, at the ends, they would have boards at a 90 degree angle to hold them together. They'd normally have a board in the middle nailed, in, nailed into it to hold them together. And that's what uh, was used. And then grain doors were supplied by the railroad to the elevators normally. And the elevators would tell the agent what, they, what they're gonna need for grain doors. The local railroad agent would order the grain doors from the railroad storehouse. And the grain doors would be loaded in a box car and shipped to the agent from the railroad storehouse. And then um, also time there would there'd be grain doors for an entire season in that car for all the elevators. Because most of the time the small towns had two elevators, sometimes three, sometimes just one, but mostly at least mostly had at least two for a little competition between them. So then the elevators would come down to the station with their trucks and they would unload their portion of the grain doors out of the box car. That's the last slide I got here. I hope I gave you guys some ideas of what you can do for modeling grain shipments on your model railroad, besides running a train from staging to staging. Now, who's got some questions? Well, we have several questions here, Bob, that came up in chat during the course of your uh, presentation. Uh, the first question was, what is the minimum number of cars that could be loaded and then added to the unit grain. 26. The grain desk sold the unit grain trains in 26 car blocks. And, and a, a full, full train was four 26 car blocks. The next question is, how did the idea of 26 car lots ever get started? How it got started, I think is the mathematicians in Fort Worth, figuring up how many cars they could uh, come up with and divide, divide it by four and, and run it profitably and make money off of it. The next question is how many cars were typically in such a unit train? Uh, most unit trains were like 108 to 110 cars. They uh, sold them in their lots. And then lots of times we'd throw extra cars. We normally try to give the elevator at least one extra car in case they had a bad order. Uh, sometimes when they get grain car gets spotted in the elevators, they would find uh, one of the hatch doors was uh, latches were broken and they couldn't latch the hatch doors down. Or they find that um, down on the bottom of the car, the, uh, the uh, slides had, had been damaged when they were, the car was unloaded last time and the slides would not close up properly. So they would bad order the car, which is another operation you do too. If you're, you can bring your, your unit grain train uh, cars into your yard and you'll have one empty mixed in with all those loads in the middle of it someplace have to switch out. Uh, you send that empty to the rip track. That's another switching move I didn't think to put on there. 
Uh, the next question is, could you see the bare plywood from inside, from, from the cars? Uh, yeah, the stock cars, yeah, you could, could see the, the, the uh, plywood on the inside of the stock cars when they were converted over. What years did those stock cars run? 19, I remember them in 1979 and 1980. Were the box, car, box cars and stock cars used for grain loading also used for other commodities in the off season? At one time, yes, but by the late 70s, they were just being used for grain loading because most people were, were, were loading wide door 50 foot cars because they could, could get the forklift trucks in and out of them. With a six foot grain door, it was harder to get your forklift truck in and out. So most people didn't want to load them anymore. Do you know what changes have been made in grain unit trains since the Well, actually what's happening today is pretty much still the same. You know, they might be using modern power and we've gone up to 110 tons on with a, what's called a C6X car. C6X are, are, are 110 ton cars. They have a larger axle beefed up truck casting so they can haul 10, 10 tons more. Like C6X cars were not permitted on, on, on the Sumas branch. They were too heavy for the Nooksack River Bridge. So if somebody loaded a 110 ton car going to the Olympus feed, We'd have to take that car to New Westminster, British Columbia, interchange it to the uh, BC Hydro. We, we always call it the Hydro. That's what British Railway, Southern uh, British Columbia these days. But they would then take the car to Abbotsford, and then they would interchange it back to the BN at Sumas for us to create a Sumas switch engine to grab it off of them and then take it to Allen Boston and spot it. Would multiple elevators or co-ops band together to order 26 cars if they couldn't each load 26? There was a few times where if in the same town where there was two elevators and each elevator would take 13 cars. Was power typically assigned always to green trees? What Fort Worth did is we had what we call coal power and we had merchandise power. And the grain train power come out of the merchandise pool. And oftentimes when grain was running heavy, we'd be holding merchandise trains for power because we didn't have any power to run. What was the cycle time on car turnaround? I really didn't, don't know because I didn't have to worry about it. It wasn't my problem. That was the grain desk problem in Fort Worth. Does anyone else have any questions for, for Bob? Bob, this is Russ Signer. I grew up in the Midwest and uh... I'm familiar with a lot of those grain operations and so on, not specifically like you've described. This is a great presentation. There was always an awful lot of trash around the grain elevators because of the use of the uh, paper and the wood for the loading doors. And of course, then all of these cars would have to go to the uh, clean out tracks uh, to get serviced each, each time they were operated. Clean out tracks. We had a clean out track in Scottsbluff, Nebraska. And that was par primarily for cleaning out cars for loading sugar in at uh, Great Western Sugar, bag sugar, because you had to have clean cars for that. Most of the time with grain cars, the elevators swept them out and cleaned them out themselves and threw the trash on the ground, it seemed like. Okay. Yeah. And then eventually they would get a great big pile of it and burn it. So, Bob, are, are you saying that, let's just take Interbay for an example, that the grain elevator, in order to make the right protein mix, would order specific cars to be sh uh, switched into the unloading area? Well, if it was wheat, okay, if it was corn, no. It depends upon if it, if it was wheat that was, going to, that was going to be going to a flour mill. Okay, now over in West Seattle, there was a flour mill over there, Fisher Flour. Fisher Flour used to order their, their cars in by car number, according to the protein in the car. So, so everything going into Fisher would have to be switched out in the yard there. So would they stage those cars in South Seattle? Yeah. Yeah, they put them in the yard in South Seattle, and they'd have to switch them out every day according to what they wanted for spotters. Are you modeling uh, Fisher on your layout? I, I am. I would say all of you people that are coming over to my house after COVID, you're going to have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs>
but between Inner Bay and Stacy Street and handling all these uh, grain cars that are now going to be switched out by car number. I now, could see that coming, Bo. Yep. Now, this Continental Grain, uh, Continental Grain, Grain, Inter 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 prior primarily handled corn. I had the impression they also did a lot of lentils and um, yeah, beans. Yeah. So the beans wouldn't be quite as sensitive to moisture and protein. I really don't know. Out in Nebraska, we grew a lot of pinto beans, and the big movement of pinto beans was actually down, down, down to the Gulf of New Mexico and to Mexico, and, and also the Mexico. Are Are you saying they would intermix the um, C sixes with the um, the box cars? No. The B ones. No. I don't mean in the train, but I mean in the uh, uh, switching it to the elevator. If the elevator ordered it in that way, yes. But normally, the box cars had a special track to unload them on because uh, they had to have the equipment. They had to have the scoop or whatever to to uh, unload the box cars. And some of the larger terminal elevators actually had a rotary dumper dump the box car on its side and, and get as much grain to fall out as they possibly could then then they would take the rest of it and get it out by hand. I was going to throw in my two cents for it. John Owens here. Uh, I think most modern day grain has moved in hopper cars these days, isn't it? With yeah, everything. Bottom, the grain flows out of the bottom over pits. Right. Almost, almost as continuous moving as uh, coal is. Yeah. But those were marketed uh, in the mid 70s, those were marketed in uh, 25 car, 50 car, 100 and 125 car grain drains out of the Midwest of the Gulf, anyway. On the Burlington Northern, we normally did 26, 24, 26. The IC used to, used to haul uh, 125s out of the Champaign, Illinois to uh, the Louisiana, Louisiana Gulf. Yeah, they had a flat railroad. So they didn't have to worry about getting drawbars. Like when I was down, when I worked on the CNS, the, or the crooked and slow as we called it, you know, a mile post 261 at Branson, Colorado was, was called Draw Bar Alley. If you're going to get a draw bar, you got it there. We found every, every cracked draw bar in the railroad there. Rail fanning in the uh, 83 to 85 time frame uh, saw strings of these 40 foot cars that came off the Mansfield branch in Apple Yard in Wenatchee. Yeah. And in one occasion, I saw that same string of cars back over at Continental Grain in Tacoma. So they were still moving it up into, I think, 85 when they shut down the Mansfield branch. When I was going to school in 1970, I worked uh, for a year at the American Car and Foundry. We did center flow hopper cars and a bunch of box cars. All the box cars were uh, wood sheathed on the inside, and they would do everything. They could hammer nails, whatever. And so uh, for the grain, uh, they really didn't have to do any treatment for a, a particulate <laughs> as bags or boxes or grain. And of course, the center flow hopper car, and as there are several different manufacturers, and that's what we we're going to talk about later on. There was an interesting thing. Well, the Hutchinson thing. I was I was uh, fly tested in the airplane business in Wichita, and so the, the grain elevator, as they said, was the largest elevator in the world at the time. Uh, that was a good landmark for flying because <laughs> you could see it 100 miles away. Uh, but the more important thing for modeling was that we had a grain elevator, or a, a, sorry, a flour mill in our hometown off the Southern Railway yard. And uh, they used a winch to spot the cars. They have maybe three, four box cars on a bit of a grade. So instead of commandeering a locomotive to move things around or a truck or whatever, they used this winch to, to lower and, and bring it back up to position the cars. So that might be something interesting to, uh, to model. Yeah, lots of elevators use a electric winch with a cable on it to move their, their, their cars. And, and other ones used uh, tractors or front end loaders. Right. I've seen elevators that actually had a draw bar at the end of a front end loader. But, and they would couple up to the string of cars and pull them and move them in, in, in the elevator complex with the front end loader to load. And... Bob, uh, you mentioned that 
you would stage the loaded grain cars in Bayside as they were called by the grain elevators north of there. And so did you do the same thing for the empties? Now the empties all flowed in the Delta yard. Back in the day, Bayside made up all the local going north then everything coming back went into Delta Yard to be uh, classified to, to leave. Were there certain tracks in certain yards that were typically used for grain storage in, in your memory? Delta Yard, track number one was called the slough track. And that's where we sloughed any, anything that we weren't gonna be switching out. Uh, no, no bill cars, cars on, on hold to be spotted to a customer and things like that all went into track one. Tracks 10, 11, 12, and 13 were the four tracks we normally use to receive trains on. And then uh, tracks two through nine are the, the uh, tracks that we classified cars on. And we built 18 blocks out of that yard every day on, on those, uh, what was it, eight, eight tracks? How about Bellingham? Okay, the yard at Bellingham, back in the day, well, when Georgia Pacific was still running, there was a three switch engines that worked at Bellingham. They came on duty at eight, four, and midnight. The paper mill got, got switched three time, times a day back, back in the day. And then there was also um, some local in industries and in the cement plant got switched. Most of the cement plants got switched twice a day. In the morning, you would go in and you would spot empty uh, cars and you would uh, spot coal, any clinker cement cars coming in, gypsum rock. And if they had loaded in any uh, cement in the morning, you would pull the cement. And then in the afternoon, the cement plants would get switched again to get uh, the uh, cement that had been loaded during, during the day and to get it lined up, weighed and moving out of town. One of the other big issues with, of course, grain elevators was uh, grain dust yeah. and explosions. Mm. And those were huge, huge problems. But the other interesting thing for grain elevators, of course, is that it's a combination of grain or the big concrete silos, which you can made out, make out of mailing tubes, uh, depending on the scale. But they also had uh, an additional collection of steel corrugated circular grain bins that they added in the 50s and 60s to add the uh, add the capacity. And then in the 50s, when they had huge crops, uh, believe it or not, they would just store the grain out in the open in big piles. Uh, speaking of the explosions and fires, I can remember when I was a kid in northern Indiana, there was uh, big grain elevators in uh, the north side of Hammond, Indiana, and one of them went up, uh, exploded, and burned for a couple of days, if I remember right. Yeah, the, the ground storage of the grain. Some elevators had big concrete pads where they would ground store. Right. And if the weather was nice, they just set out there in, in, in the open until they could get railroad cars loaded in. And if the weather wasn't going to be nice, they would put tarps over it and they would put tires all over the top of these, these tarps. I used to wonder where they got all these tires from. Hundreds of tires. Yeah. On, on that on that pile of grain holding the tarps down. Bob, that was really an outstanding clinic. Thank you very much for presenting it tonight. I've got a question for you, Bob. I've been in the Midwest and seen uh, mountains of uh, sugar beets. Yeah. Uh, were they primarily transported by truck and processed into sugar before it ever touched a train? It depended upon where you were. The beets that you saw, it depends upon the era that you're modeling. If you're modeling the 70s, 80s, there was some big sugar beet terminals and all the beets were all trucked in there and then 20, 30 cars of beets at a time would be loaded out every day. Okay, what? if you're modeling 40 to 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, like, uh, like, like when I worked down in the North Platte Valley, there was a whole series of branch lines that ran out of Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And even at, uh, if we had a Wyatt Baird at, at, at the sugar factory, and that Wyatt one time went, went about five miles out, out of town to service some uh, beet dumps way out in the middle of the valley there. And they, we only went out there during sugar beet season, is what I was told. And then there was also 
some beet dumps along along the main line. We had a track that went back into the beet dump at Bridgeport, Nebraska, that would hold 90 cars. Are those primarily hopper cars? Yeah. Or another well, when I when I worked there, I worked the beet rushes in 79 and 80. And after the 1980 beet rush, the Orin line had opened up. And the railroad basically ran the sugar beet business off because they, they didn't want it in the way of the coal trains. I was working third trick operator at Baird, Nebraska, and they called the crew with two SD40s and caboose out of Alliance. They went to Mitchell. They pulled all the empty beat cars out of Mitchell except for 20. They left 20 cars there. Then they come down to Baird. They pulled all the empty beat cars out of Baird except for 10, left 10 beat cars at Baird. When that train left Bridgeport that night, I think they had around 150 beat cars on it. Empty. Yeah, empty. But these beat cars are old, beat up CB and Q, Northern Pacific, and Great Northern Two Bay coal hoppers for the most part. Some of the CB and Q cars still had wood sides on it for World War II that had never been converted to, to steel after, after the war. And that's what we, we were loading beets in. And, and another beet movement was off the CNS at Wheatland, Wyoming. Uh, Great Western Sugar would load 90 car trains of beets three times a week normally. And they would run it as a unit train out, out of Wheatland up to Wendover Junction and on down through Guernsey and to Mitchell, New Nebraska. And, and all of the, the beets being processed with Mitchell came from uh, Wheatland, Wyoming area. And on the other side of the river, the Union Pacific had a branch line that, that ran from Torrington down, connected to the, uh, to the main line near North, North Platte. And they used to run a, a, a local from North Platte to Sterling, and they, they lay overnight at Sterling and go back to North Platte the next day. And during, during the beet season, um, Holly Sugar Company and Torrington used to get beets in on, on Union Pacific at Torrington, and they got beets in on Union Pacific at Gearing. I might mention on the narrow gauge, both in California and some places in Colorado and so on, sugar beets were a big product handled by the narrow gauge lines. They often would hold, they handle this in gondolas, uh, three and four board high flat cars with board sidings. And uh, those were loaded off of big platforms that they'd drive the, originally the wagons up on, and they just end dump the wagons into the, uh, the gons of sugar beets. A pretty primitive operation. And of course, then at the uh, processing plants, they would be all hand, handled out by shovel. But there was an awful lot of that stuff moved on the um, narrow gauge early on. The other thing at Baird when I worked there, third trick, Great Western Sugar had, a, had an 040 saddle tank switcher that they switched the beats with. And every night at 2 a.m., I go over to the sugar plant to do yard check. And they only, they only unloaded beats at night. I couldn't get any pictures of this thing in operation, but that little 040 would get a hold of six cars of beets and then have to push it up the ramp onto the unloading dock. And in you know, listen to that thing out there at night when you're doing your yard check, you would have swore there there was a a, a, a big 080 or 282 or something out there switching. That thing was so loud when it was pushing those six six cars up up the trussle. I loved it. Potato hopper car trivia, American Car and Foundry, when I was there, uh, they insulated the hopper cars on the outside, spray on this insulation, because mm -hmm. potatoes before the process can't be below freezing. They, it ruins them so that when they're cooked and diced and all that, uh, so you can buy them in the grocery store. But until that point, <coughs> they have to be kept uh, above freezing. So that's why you have all these bunker looking strange things uh, for storage in uh, Eastern Washington and Idaho and such. So uh, anyway, they also have to be treated very delicately. So the big center flow hopper cars, uh, it, you had to be very careful when you're loading and unloading the potatoes so you don't bruise them and, and whatnot, kind of like bananas, I guess. But uh, anyway, I don't know how you'd apply that coating to um, <laughs> a center flow hopper car or any other hopper car, I guess, uh, make it look kind of fuzzy. But uh, if you want to have a potato industry, uh, that would be one way of handling the uh, transport of the potatoes before they get to the processing plant. 
And it was the potatoes that come out of Colorado, they were all loaded bulk. Uh, basically, they, they put the equivalent wooden wooden uh, grain doors across the, the refrigerator car doors, loaded in bulk of there. Then when they got down, down to Houston, they used fire hoses to unload the potatoes. They just well, flushed them out of the car. So, so, so yeah, they uh, flushed the potatoes out of the car with a fire hose? Yeah. Yeah, they just float them out and they... I've never seen them do it. I was just talking to the guys at Schumann Produce on the phone. He told me, yeah, they, they have a big uh, like scoop that they put up to the car door that mm. directed the, the, uh, the potatoes in into the basement of, of the processing plant there. And they uh, washed them and then they re, uh, re bag bagged them to go to grocery stores in, in, mm. in five and 10 pound bags. Wow, that's all very interesting. I'm, I'm, as I get a little bit further along with my layout, I think I'm definitely going to be picking uh, some people's brains for, uh, for ideas here because that's all good stuff to model. Okay, uh, well, that, that's about it. We'll, we'll see. We'll see everybody later. Bye-bye.